Good evening. I'm David Common. Ian is away. Tonight, the deadly chaos at the Kabul airport, the global effort to get people out, and the question, is Canada doing enough? We are going to continue to do everything in our power to evacuate as many people as possible. France sent buses, the United States sent helicopters, Canada has sent emails. Responding to a humanitarian crisis from the campaign trail. Also tonight. They're all such great kids. They all deserve so much. The BC hockey community mourns the loss of three bright lights, young players killed in a car crash. A brutal weather weekend in the United States, deadly flooding in Tennessee, while a rare tropical storm roars across the Northeast. I looked outside, it was like a raging river. And a pandemic project turned tradition. The first message that I wrote was, everything will be okay. This is The National. In the weeks since the Taliban took control of Afghanistan's capital, the chaotic scene around Kabul's airport has been at once constant and constantly changing. Every day, more people surge toward it, putting themselves in danger in hopes of getting out to safety. Today, at least seven more Afghans died as a crush of people tried to get in. Amid growing security concerns, access is controlled by U.S. soldiers on one side, with the Taliban on the other. Canada, like other countries, is racing to evacuate Canadian citizens and those who worked with the Canadian military while they can. So far, Canada has organized a dozen military flights out of Kabul, carrying more than 1,100 people. But as Ashley Burke shows us, with Canadians still stranded and the officials in charge now also out on the campaign trail, criticism is mounting that the government isn't doing enough. Amid a crushing crowd, a desperate attempt to get inside Kabul's airport. Gunfire, dangerous Taliban checkpoints. These are the conditions those eligible to come to Canada say they're navigating without military protection. A Canadian stuck in Afghanistan said he tried to get inside the airfield five times and he and his six children still haven't made it. Every checkpoint is like a death sentence for me and for my kids and for my family. What is the point of this come calling us here and not taking us into the airfield? Today, a group of federal cabinet ministers gathered to address the situation. The defense minister said he wishes it was as simple as applicants showing up and raising their hands to get in, but it's not. Sometimes the U.S. has to make a decision just temporarily to having to close the gate for security uh, uh, reasons, but I can assure you every single time, those gates are open. We have Canadian Armed Forces personnel um, uh, there. Canada facing growing criticism, it hasn't done enough. France sent buses. The United States sent helicopters. Canada has sent emails. In contrast, Germany's military deployed these aircraft to pick up those stuck outside the airport. France negotiated with the Taliban for safe passage of a convoy of buses to the airfield. Canada won't say if it will do the same. I don't want to go into details, uh, uh, operational details right now, but I can assure you we have given uh, the authorizations for the folks on the ground to make the right decisions to help as many people as possible given the risks of the situation. Okay. On the campaign trail today, Trudeau's opponents accused him of being distracted. Maybe the fact that Justin Trudeau called an election might have imp impacted his ability to plan for the, the release or the, the evacuation of... Uh, our allies in Afghanistan. Well, clearly, the federal government is is in an election mode. Meanwhile, in Afghanistan, people are losing hope. This is so, so very bad. Like, we, we're going to be here for the next uh, few more hours. And right now, can you hear the, the shooting in the background? Because we have been engaged by the Afghan National Security Forces that keep shooting at us with life rounds, trying to kill us. Officials say the urgency is real and it's ramping up its evacuation efforts along with cutting all red tape. Ashley Burke, CBC News, Ottawa. We're going to come back to how this is playing out on the campaign trail in a moment. But first, let's turn to the U.S. evacuation effort. Today, Joe Biden said it is accelerating with 11,000 people being airlifted out of Kabul just this weekend. And as Lauren Pelly explains, commercial planes are now playing a part. 
Plane after plane, hour after hour. The U.S. evacuation mission is shuttling hundreds from Taliban-controlled Afghanistan to this American Air Force base in Germany. It's uh, enormous because it is such a huge humanitarian mission. To ease overcrowding, U.S. officials have ordered commercial planes to ferry evacuees between bases. But they won't be flying into Kabul, where security is becoming a bigger concern. U.S. forces were shooting fires, uh, Taliban, and also like Afghan forces too, at the gate. So people were getting hurt left and right, and uh, it was a really bad situation. The new worry? The city's crowded airfield is a target for terrorist attacks. Recent footage shows aircraft shooting flares upon takeoff, meant to confuse heat-seeking missiles. There is no way to evacuate this many people without pain and loss of heartbreaking images you see on television. It's just a fact. Today, President Joe Biden defended his decision to withdraw U.S. troops, but suggested the August 31st deadline could be extended. At the end of the day, if we didn't leave Afghanistan now, when do we leave? Another 10 years? Another five years? Another year? This is utter chaos. And he was saying, well, you know, there would have been chaos anyway. This is not what most experts say. This Canadian political expert says there's blame to go around, but... The Biden administration owns this because the execution has been so bad. Mistakes have been piled up on miscues. And the intelligence reports that they had were either ill-informed or they were ignored. U.S. officials say they're ramping up evacuations and Americans remain the top priority. Biden will meet with his G7 counterparts on Tuesday. Lauren Pelly, CBC News, Toronto. What is unfolding in Afghanistan continues to make its way onto the campaign trail. Today, once again, the Liberal leader was asked questions about government efforts to get Afghans out. It's something our chief political correspondent, Rosemary Barton, has been tracking along with the entire campaign. Rosie, walk us through how Afghanistan is having an impact. David, you know, it has overshadowed parts of the campaign so far, particularly, of course, for Justin Trudeau. He is still the prime minister. He's been getting regular briefings on the security situation. He will, of course, be part of the G7 meeting if it happens this week, as expected. That pre press conference today, though, with those four cabinet ministers was really an attempt to demonstrate the liberals are capable of managing this humanitarian crisis as a government and also an election. The problem, of course, is that so much in Afghanistan, as you've been hearing, is chaotic and very challenging to manage on the ground. There is a lot of political risk here for the Liberals if something goes terribly wrong or if they are seen as not doing as much as other allies. That's already been part of the criticism. It also means that the Liberal leader is getting a lot of questions about this situation and not about his campaign and the narrative he wants to be presenting to Canadians right now. And that ultimately is a political challenge there for him too. All right. Chief Political Correspondent Rosie Barton. Thank you. Thanks, David. Today also marks the end of the first week of the election campaign. Here is a quick wrap-up from our reporters on the trail of the major parties, starting with Rafi Bouchkanian with the Liberal campaign on PEI. Today was all about shoring up support for the Liberal leader. All three writings Justin Trudeau hit in Atlantic Canada are in Liberal hands. But in two of them, new candidates are running, and the Liberals did lose six seats in this region in 2019. No new announcements today. Trudeau brought along Public Procurement Minister Anita Anand, who is seeking re-election in Ontario, to focus on their record of pandemic management. Trudeau introduced her to crowds as the Minister of Vaccines. He slammed Conservative leader Erin O'Toole for opposing mandatory vaccinations for travellers and for proposing tax credits to cover daycare costs. I'm Hannah Thibodeau with the Conservative campaign in Richmond, B.C. Aaron O'Toole and his team feel they've had a strong start to the campaign. But to cross over from opposition benches, they'll have to make inroads in big provinces like British Columbia. And today he took aim at the left to center vote with the promise to help addicts. $325 million over three years to create recovery centers and treatment beds. He also said an O'Toole government would not block safe injection sites. I don't think someone with an addiction should be punished. And I have said I would like to see compassion at the center of our justice system for people with addiction. This marks a big change from former Conservative leaders and their tough-on-crime stance. 
I'm Olivia Stefanovich with NDP leader Jungmeet Singh in Toronto. Today, on the 10th anniversary of Jack Layden's death, Singh promised to change the name of the former NDP leader's riding from Toronto Danforth to Danforth Layton. It's something that reflects the legacy of Jack Layton, and he's a big part of the city. And I think it's a, a fitting way to pay homage and to respect everything that he's done and, and the legacy that he's left behind. Voters had something to say about that. Well, it's going to cost money, which shouldn't have to be spent on something that's already working well. Therefore, it's already been baptized. You, you can't change a name after it, you've named it already. Singh says the move is not unprecedented. There are other ridings named after politicians, but it is unusual for a federal leader to make such a pitch during a federal election campaign. Meanwhile, the Bloc Québécois unveiled a platform that's designed to fulfill major ambitions. Chloe Rinaldi shows us how Battlefield Quebec is really a showdown between two players. We have to protect our values. We have to promote our language. Bloc Québécois leader Yves-François Blanchet says his platform is in line with what really matters to Quebecers. One priority in the 29-page document moving away from a carbon economy. We also want to go forward with this idea of Quebec transforming its own natural resources, Quebec using its research centers, acknowledged uh, capacity to innovate. Blanchet promised to pump up the province's workforce, pressure Ottawa to cover 35% of health care costs, and improve the Quebec pension plan, all in a bid to win the province over, build on the last election, and this time capture a majority of the 78 seats in Quebec. If the bloc is able to reach 40 seats and a majority in Quebec, that almost ensures that they will be a minority government in Ottawa because the Liberals are counting on a lot of seats in Quebec to get them to 170 seats. The rise of the Bloc in 2019 helped hold the Liberals to a minority. Today, his appeal put the Liberal leader on the defensive, as Justin Trudeau pointed to Liberal investments in the province, high-speed internet, the aerospace industry, and the new daycare deal. He says it was not the Bloc that did that, but the Liberals and the Quebec government. Bringing up that relationship is a reminder that Quebec's Premier is now on side with the Liberals. Is that François Legault has not said anything so far during the campaign, anything that could help the Bloc, as opposed to the last campaign in 2019, when he criticized Justin Trudeau for his position on Quebec's Bill 21 on secularism, and that cost the Liberals. The Bloc, however, is bringing Bill 21 back into the campaign. It's adamant that no federal money should be used to challenge the controversial law. The BQ's platform is not costed, but Blanchette promises more details in the coming days. Chloe Rinaldi, CBC News, Montreal. The election, of course, is all about you choosing your government, and we need to hear from you about what matters most. In just a few weeks, on September 9th, the leaders of the main federal parties will take part in the English language debate. We want to know what you're worried about. Your top issue might be COVID-19 or housing, the economy, or something else altogether. Go to cbcnews.ca and you'll find a link that asks, what do you want party leaders to talk about in the election debate? BC's hockey community is mourning the loss of three teenage players tonight after a fatal single car crash this weekend. One person after the next stopped along the side of the road in Surrey, BC today to remember and grieve. Teenagers Ronan Sharma, Parker Magnuson and Caleb Reimer. It just kind of hits home, right? Just young kids losing their lives like that is, like you said, it's not natural. They all had so much going for them. It's, I can't believe what happened. They were so young. The shock of their sudden deaths is still raw. Many mourning the loss of their friendship, their talent, and their bright futures. Ronan, I know one thing for sure. As soon as you saw that kid smile, it, like, it lit open a whole room. They're all such great kids. They all deserve so much. They all are so kind to everybody. All three teens played with the Delta Hockey Academy. Their jerseys now displayed at a Delta arena it's become a memorial site. Among those tweeting condolences today, the NHL and the Humboldt Broncos, a team that knows tragedy all too well. The cause of the crash itself is still under investigation. It has been a deadly weekend in the U.S. with separate storms leaving states waterlogged.
Flash flooding in Tennessee where at least 22 people are dead. Among them, twin toddlers swept from their father's arms. A record-breaking 43 centimeters fell, mostly in rural areas. Rescuers are now going door-to-door -door looking for the dozens of people reported missing. And in the northeast, Henri, it's no longer a hurricane, but the tropical storm is still causing plenty of damage. It hit the coast of Rhode Island today with winds over 110 kilometers an hour and is currently on track to cross from New England into Nova Scotia. Chris Reyes gives us a look at the damage so far. Power outages, flash flooding, storm surges. That's what millions of people in the northeast region of the U.S. woke up to Sunday. Tropical storm Henri made landfall in Rhode Island this afternoon. Even as it was downgraded, damage from heavy rains and wild winds put everyone in the area on high alert. New York, Connecticut and Rhode Island are all under a state of emergency. The affected area is very large and the amount of rainfall is very large and the potential for serious damage from flooding is very large. Storm surge is the big worry. 11 million people are under flash flood warnings tonight, covering most of New York City, New Jersey and southern New York. This storm has the potential for widespread consequences across the region with significant flooding and power outages that could affect hundreds of thousands of people. I'm in New Jersey. That's Manhattan across the Hudson River. It's been raining pretty steady here. Last night, Central Park set a record for the most amount of rain in one hour for that location, canceling the city's big concert. Due to approaching severe weather. It was billed as a COVID-19 recovery concert, but fans went home soaked without seeing headliners Bruce Springsteen and Paul Simon. People from New Jersey to Maine lost power overnight into Sunday, the outages affecting more than 135,000 homes. I woke up, my power was off, I went to check on something, I started to walk, there was up ankle deep water. I looked outside, it was like a raging river on each side, and then they finally, they came and they took us out in the boats. Henri is not done yet. The storm is expected to stall near the Connecticut-New York border, moving to southern Massachusetts on Monday and near Nova Scotia on Tuesday. Chris Reyes, CBC News, Weehawken, New Jersey. Another hurricane, Grace, hit Mexico's Gulf Coast this weekend. Winds over 200 kilometers an hour blasted as Grace made its second landfall in as many days. One of the most powerful storms to hit that coast in years. Eight people have been killed. Well, now let's turn to Canada's COVID-19 story tonight and a troubling trend that's ramping up as summer winds down. This is the cause of the growing concern as fall draws closer. The rolling seven-day average of new infections across the country has been climbing steadily for a month from below 400 to well over 2000 and that is despite climbing vaccination rates almost 75 percent of eligible canadians have now had both shots in some places in this country this weekend brought new worries and even new restrictions renee filippone explains <laughs> It's part of BC under the toughest COVID restrictions, but life carries on in Kelowna. I'm not overly concerned, but I am also in favor of putting on our vaccines so that we can all get through this and go back to normal as soon as possible. BC's interior has been a hot spot for COVID infections. As a result, masks are mandatory again across that health region. And with increased pressure on hospitals, there is a return to limits on indoor personal gatherings. The trend is, has not been so great over the past few weeks. We've been seeing the cases double about every nine or ten days. This COVID modeling expert says plans to fully reopen the province on September 7th will likely be delayed because of the surging Delta variant. But it wouldn't surprise me too much to see the whole province moving back maybe to a mass mandate within, within a few weeks. B.C. isn't alone. The Northwest Territories are under such pressure, the Army has been called in to help. So we're starting to see the disparities of these small communities which lack the basic necessary uh, services of health care, RCMP service, and other things. It's even affected the election campaign. One candidate says he is suspending in-person campaigning because of COVID concerns. 
The surge in cases across the West is enough for some frontline workers in Alberta to raise the alarm about potential staff shortages at hospitals. I'm, I'm quite worried about um, how the health care system is going to manage it, how our frontline health care workers are going to come out on the other side of this. All of this concern is a stark contrast to the festival atmosphere at Vancouver's Pacific National Exhibition. It's one day that we all get together because we live all over the Lower Mainland now. So yeah, it's, it's, it's great. We're happy that it's open again. Enjoying what's left of the summer, aware of the uncertainty that lies ahead. Renee Filipponi, CBC News, Vancouver. American civil rights pioneer Jesse Jackson has been hospitalized for COVID-19 despite being vaccinated. You see Reverend Jackson there getting his first shot back in January, now being treated in a Chicago hospital along with his wife. They are both in their late 70s. Many Haitians are still living without life-saving aid, more than a week after the country was struck by a devastating earthquake. If you are in disaster yourself, you can have 10 people in disaster. And the government is in a, in, a, in a disaster. Up next, finding the way forward for a country facing crisis after crisis. And later, with the Delta variant rising fast, a new focus on what we're breathing in. I think ventilation to a great extent has been the missing piece in this discussion. The push to improve air quality in the places we work and in the dark days of the pandemic, some much needed color. As soon as they see the message, they just brighten up a little bit. Spreading messages of hope on the sidewalk. We're back in a moment. U.S. Coast Guard units are evacuating people with severe medical issues from Haiti a week after the devastating earthquake that has now taken at least 2,200 lives. Rescue teams from Brazil and Mexico arrived this weekend. Haiti has been pleading for more foreign assistance, which has been slow to arrive. Now, it is hard to overstate the shock, fear, and emotional trauma so many Haitians are feeling after all of this. It has been crisis after crisis, tragedy after tragedy. And it's not clear how the situation will improve. Ellen Morrow has been in Haiti this past week, and tonight she looks at the many challenges ahead for this battered nation. The rituals of death, pain so searing and so common now as Haiti suffers its latest crisis. While the dead are buried, the living languish. Desperately needed aid still just barely trickling through. I'm in pain, says this man who lost four relatives. Only God can help me. In the capital, Port-au-Prince, signs of Haiti's other crises, its crushing poverty and lack of infrastructure are everywhere. So too are billboards of the country's recently assassinated president, Jovenel Moise. Haiti was already mired in long-standing political turmoil before his killing. Now a debilitating power vacuum compounded by a devastating earthquake. Haitians have used to live with the concept that there is no state. There's no government. This is a famous piece. This was a very prestigious. Jackie Lumarque, who once tried to run for president, is the rector of Haiti's leading private university. The school is helping to restore cultural artifacts damaged in the 2010 earthquake that killed more than 200,000 people. How does the political instability here impact um, the response to this most recent disaster? The earthquake comes as a disaster, but we were also in a national disaster. If you are in disaster yourself, you cannot uh, help people in, disa in disaster. And the government is in a, in a, in a disaster stress. Haiti has a proud past, but a difficult history. Here, enslaved people threw off their French rulers, but were then forced to compensate them for more than a century. Haiti is the poorest country in the Western Hemisphere. It never really recovered from 2010. There are allegations that billions of dollars in aid has been mismanaged and lawlessness is increasingly rampant. People are fleeing because they cannot have any, any job, because the state cannot provide the environment to create wealth in the country. And then you have a 7.2 magnitude earthquake. This is, uh, it's just like uh, nature is against us. Fritz Jean once served as Haiti's interim prime minister and governor of its central bank. Chronic capitalism, this is what we are experiencing in Haiti. 
privilege granted to those people and the exclusion of uh, the majority of the, of the Haitian citizenship. Before the earthquake, elections were set for November, but that plan may now prove impossible. Some want international help to stabilize the country, others fear even more outside influence. What's needed, says Lamarck, is a chance for the country to catch its breath. Now you have to gather everybody on the table, listen to everybody, and design a strategy for first, a new constitution, second, security, and third, elections. Do you have hope that things are going to get better? They are an opportunity to learn from these disasters and, and to, to become stronger. But for now, Haiti's pain drags on. Ellen, after a week in Haiti, you've seen this crisis firsthand, some awful scenes as we've seen just there right now. What is sticking most for you? Well, David, the need is so great in the hardest hit areas by these earthquake, by this earthquake. And these are remote places that are hard to get to. So it's hard to think about some of these people just never getting the help that they need. The other hard part is thinking about all those children we saw this week with terrible injuries from this earthquake, struggling to get the care that they require in overrun, unsanitary facilities. And it really just is unclear how this immediate crisis is going to be addressed. All right. Well, thank you very much for your reporting. That is Ellen Morrow in Port-au-Prince, Haiti for us tonight. The world has watched what is unfolding in Afghanistan with horror, but for Canadian soldiers who served there, it's even harder to swallow. Coming up next, two veterans share their thoughts and their pain about Canada's legacy in Afghanistan. Plus, it pulls the air in from the classroom, it filters it, at that level, and then it brings it back into the classroom. Coming up, as the Delta variant rises, a new focus on workplace ventilation. But first, a preview of some special stories we're bringing you all this week. Moments of love and reunion, months and years in the making. Quick last minute panic check. Passport, COVID test, vaccine card. It had been seven months since we saw each other. Her and Zayden uh, just boarded their second flight. I'm so nervous. T-minus 10 days until I meet my brother for the first time. I suspect that, that this will be kind of an emotional visit. I expect it to be very apparent that we're landing in Nova Scotia for the first time in my life that my father hasn't been there. I haven't seen them since they left in August. 2019. I would never have anticipated when I said goodbye to them then. We made it! So here we are at Tofino, the west coast of Vancouver Island, and we were so happy in the end to finally be able to reunite with our family. A week after the Taliban took control of Afghanistan's capital, terrified people continue to rush the gates of Kabul's airport, desperate to get to safety. Now, among them, Canadians and Afghans who once worked with the Canadian military in the country. A former captain of Afghanistan's national women's soccer team says players still in the country are well known and therefore in danger. She has been advising them to scrub their profiles and pictures from social media, get out of their communities if they can, and to do something else, it's heartbreaking. I have been telling them that please try to get, get, get rid of the, your national jersey, the jersey that I remember first time wearing, uh, for the first time in the history of Afghanistan, women wearing jersey. And I, I, it was the most beautiful feeling when I play, played with the jersey of Afghanistan women's national team. The pride, the happiness, and the, like, the feeling was amazing, the, the feeling of winning, but it is, it is hard, it's, it's very tough for me to even thinking about it or, or, and talking to our players to get rid of your jerseys, to even burn down. It's your uniform and if they find out, you will be in danger. That fear and panic, the scenes of the Taliban retaking towns and cities, all of it cuts deep for members of Canada's armed forces who were deployed there. Service that came at great cost. 40,000 people served in Afghanistan over Canada's 12-year mission there. 158 
lost their lives. Thousands more were wounded, physically and psychologically, leading to additional deaths by suicide. It was and is an immense sacrifice. So how do the people who put their lives on the line feel about what they're seeing now? Joining me now are two Canadian Armed Forces veterans who served in Afghanistan. Tyson Bowen served for two combat tours in 2007 and 2010. And Mike Akpata served in 2007. Uh, thanks very much to both of you for taking some time out of your evening to speak with us. I, I want to um, start, if I can, um, with your respective missions in Afghanistan. And Mike, uh, just starting with you, because you were in, in Kandahar in 07. What did you feel at that time you were accomplishing? What we were doing, or what I believe I was doing, was as part of the responsibilities when NATO went to Afghanistan. I, as a reservist, augmented 2nd Battalion Royal Canadian Regiment. And bottom line was this. Uh, reservists have fundamental beliefs in support of Canada, in support of Canadian missions. My goal was to make sure that the gentlemen in the battle group, ladies and gentlemen, and those at the four operating bases, got everything they need, and to do my duty when called upon to support Canadian missions in accordance with government policy. I want to pick, Mike, up on a word you use, believed at the time. Is that just a phrase that you're using, or what were you, has something shifted in your mind? It has become hard now. Mm. Watching the fall of Kandahar during the 4th of July, the 4th of July for, for our tour, dare I speak for Tyson as well, resonates because a number of Canadians were killed in an RG-31. Yeah, so it's a Kandahar, fighting vehicle, yeah. Yes, sir. Uh, an RG-31 is an up-armored vehicle called an Ayala that we used in Afghanistan. When Kandahar fell, I have friends who have come home with visible injuries, some with injuries hidden, and all of a sudden, we as a collective began to wonder, what did we do? What was it worth? But not so much for me, for the families of the fallen and the 199 or some odd Canadian veterans that have taken their lives, it's for those families. Because pundits are saying, they're talking about the amount of money that's been spent, the amount of treasure, and I remember those faces of every ramp ceremony I went to and those young men and women who I served with. Tyson, uh, listening to what Mike is saying, uh, I imagine you're feeling some of the same things, but I wonder what do you hold on to to remember what was achieved? The biggest thing that we can hold on to to keep our heads held high is that we were called upon by the Canadian government to assist the government of Afghanistan, and we did our job to the utmost uh, professionalism degree and yet you must face people in your own lives, uh, and, and Tyson, I would go back to you on this, who question what it was all for. Yeah, absolutely, and uh, we do question what it's for, and that's going to be part of the healing process as we, we move forward. Uh, a lot of us are struggling right now, and I believe you will see an increased rate of suicide amongst uh, veterans from Afghanistan and veterans who are still serving that have uh, yet to deal with their internal traumas from while they were serving in Afghanistan. But the, like I said, the biggest thing that people need to know and the men and women are in uniform and that served in uniform is that we did a job, we were called upon by our government, and we did it well. We supported the, the people of Afghanistan and the government of Afghanistan. And now our role is to support the people of Afghanistan who want to get out of there. What is your concern now Mike, in terms of taking care of the veterans and, and, and all of those who remain in Afghanistan? My biggest concern is during our missions, we were the number three uh, RG31. So sometimes we had the interpreter in our vehicle. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to suggest that we became friendly, but I knew him. I know his name. I have pictures of him. I don't know if his dedication to keeping us alive has cost him his life has cost his family their lives. Is he in hiding? Is he out? Briefly, Mike, uh, do you believe we have a commitment to people like that? And if so, have we lived up to that commitment? I believe this. When I took my oath to get into the military, I swore an oath to defend this country. I swore an oath to Her Majesty, her heirs and successors, like every other Canadian soldier has done. Those people would not have done what they did. Those women would not have run to be mayors. Those female police chiefs and police officers would not have risked their lives and exposed their faces 
in magazines and interviews if they just thought that we were going to melt away into the evening. So I truly believe that a country, an individual, is only as good as his, her, the national word that we give to people. I'm sorry, but I'm very heartbroken that I don't believe that we've fulfilled our responsibilities to those that trusted us so much. Mike, Tyson, uh, thank you, both of you, and um, please do take care. Thank you, thank sir. You Mass distancing and vaccines are widely seen as the best tools in the fight against COVID-19, but what about ventilation? These are bag filters, so you're actually double filtering the air. What some workplaces are doing. Welcome back. For Canadians working indoors and the many soon heading back, a growing body of research is putting new focus on ventilation to fight the spread of COVID-19. Yuena Romiliota shows us how some companies are tackling that. The office towers are still pretty empty, but hundreds of people will come back to work here. And Sal Mantia is ready. Let me take you for a tour of our building, HVAC systems, and how we're doing to combat COVID. Mantia is operations manager for Choice Properties, and when he comes to filtering the air people share, his job starts here. Let me show you how air is brought into the building here. This is where air is introduced to the main shaft of the building. As you can see here, the dampers are wide open, allowing for 100% fresh air to come in. Before that outdoor air goes any further, it passes through a wall of high-grade filters. First set of filtration is coming through these filters. They are MERV-13 filters. What does MERV-13 mean? MERV-13 is a grading of filters. So the higher the MERV rating means that it can capture smaller particles. The duct tape is an added measure. Duct tape here actually forces the air to pass through the filter. There's always a bit of leakage. And why is it so important to do all this? Well, we want to make sure that we have a safe environment for attendants to set up shop and work. And it's, it's what we do. This is our business. This is what we take pride in our buildings. We want to make sure that we are providing safe work environments. COVID has made clean air more important than ever because the risk of airborne transmission of the virus is now clearer than ever. And we're not talking about someone sneezing or coughing close to you, but from tiny infected particles expelled and inhaled when people are talking, singing or shouting. Those aerosols can travel in a cloud indoors for longer distances and linger in the air indefinitely. Public health authorities in Canada only recently acknowledged the aerosol risk. The guidance on how to manage it is still emerging. The places acting on the threat didn't wait for it. Our public health standards talk about good ventilation. So what's good ventilation? How do you actually quantify that from an engineering perspective? So we've relied on the science that, that's out there. Ron Saporta is the chief operating officer at the University of Toronto. He started tracking the aerosol research from the start. The university has a mix of century-old and modern buildings. MERV-13 filters were installed and the volume of fresh air increased, especially in high-density spaces like classrooms. This is one of our buildings at the... The Rotten airborne School risk Network. is higher the longer more campus. people are indoors together. And I'm going to show you one of our classrooms where we put in one of the air purifiers. But some spaces are harder to purify through mechanical ventilation. Supporta had portable air cleaners with high-grade HEPA filters installed in those rooms. So there's a HEPA filter in there. It pulls the air in from the classroom. It filters it at that level, and then it brings it back into the classroom. So what we've decided to do was to set up a specific uh, target for ventilation in our classrooms. And what we've done is we've set it at six air changes per hour. So uh, six air changes per hour, it's about the ventilation rates you'd see in hospitals and places like clinics. Clean air is a critical piece, especially as the race between variants and vaccines continues. But it's not clear how many settings are taking ventilation precautions, even among ones that have been operating this whole time. We reached out to several essential workplaces that had numerous past outbreaks. They either declined to speak to us or didn't respond to our inquiries. Hi, everyone. As people start returning to work, what is it they should be aware of Raising awareness is critical and, and is why a group of aerosol experts has come together. Cleaning the air will do much more than cleaning and disinfecting everything in sight. 
Marianne Levitsky is an occupational hygienist, an expert in workplace safety. She says safe air is critical to a safe workplace. If you look at the major outbreaks that happened in workplaces, we have to ask why. Because we know, at least the employer said, they were implementing the measures that they were being requested to implement, you know, plexiglass barriers, masks, distancing, cleaning, etc. And yet workers were still getting sick. So what was, what was not being implemented? Well, it was probably ventilate, good ventilation and proper respiratory protection. And what is your main concern right now? My main concern is that we're not paying enough attention to the aerosol nature of the, of the virus and the fact that it can be transmitted in the air. So I think ventilation to a great extent has been the missing piece in this discussion. Sean Stone learned that the hard way. I think when something impacts you personally and very, very close to you, it, uh, it hits home. Let's just have a look at the Rogers. Stone and several of his dozen employees got sick with COVID last spring, despite following all the public health precautions. And we make sure that the dates are correct. And, uh, his company distributes electronic components. As an essential business, it's been open the whole time. We don't need or want to wait for the government to do the right thing. And the right thing is to create a healthy, safe environment for our people to come and work. I think the worst thing for somebody would be to be worried about their well-being uh, going to work every day. So we're trying to mitigate that as much as we can. I'm just going to go and stick the O2 meter outside. That included connecting with industry advocate Larry Gold. 397 to 398 parts. Who is helping small businesses figure out what they can do to mitigate the aerosol risk. Measuring CO2 levels is one way to detect a concentration of unfiltered air. 397, which is minuscule difference. So, so is keeping the space well ventilated. The warehouse door stays open most of the time, and the plan is to keep it open regularly, even when the weather gets colder. So ideally, we do want it to be in the middle of the room. Obviously, because of the different obstacles, we're going to have to play around with it. We'll and in the office area, the where airflow is more limited, so Stone invested in four portable air cleaners with HEPA filters. We got one in this area, one in there. We got one in this room here. Especially On top of all this, Stone is also offering his employees a bonus to get vaccinated. I don't think it's our job to push people towards vaccination. I think we can promote it. So what we did as a little company was we offered to the staff a $100 bonus for the first jab and another $100 for the second jab. And you didn't think that that was enough to have a vaccinated workforce? Oh, definitely not. Our fear is that uh, the only measure the government has is uh, lockdown and vaccinations. I don't think that's good enough. I don't think lockdown is uh, acceptable anymore. A layered approach is key. Back at the University of Toronto, they're even testing wastewater for COVID in residences and have already identified one case. As for choice properties, rapid testing is offered at some of its buildings. There are at-home testing kits too and the usual wipes. And employees also get higher grade masks. So even after we have the MERV 13 filters, we're actually filtering it again through another set of filters. Back in the boiler room, a reminder of how much is at stake. These are bag filters. So you're going through MERV 13, and now you're going through this set of filters. So you're actually double filtering the air. Wow, that's a lot of filtration. It is a lot of filtration. We are doing this because we need to do this. Especially as more people go back indoors and go back to breathing in the same air. Joanna Rumeliotis, CBC News, Toronto. Next on The National, how a pandemic coping mechanism turned into a neighborhood tradition. We give you the tools. You make the choice. CBC provides everything you need to make an informed decision on Election Day. Informed by you. Canada Votes 2021. It started as a pandemic pastime, a little color on the sidewalk to lift spirits. But... It has become a habit for one Ontario neighbourhood. The message and the medium is our moment. It started as something that I did just to pass the time. Playing with the kids and adding some chalk art to the sidewalk was just my way of beautifying the neighbourhood, maybe adding some positive things. 
The first message that I wrote was, everything will be okay. As soon as they see the message, they just brighten up a little bit. One day, somebody walked by, and I don't think that they knew that we could see them. And he pulled a, a box of sidewalk chalk out of his pocket and put it on the sidewalk right in front of my house and just kind of like, it was like a little thank you for the work that we had done. And I, that really warmed my heart. It kind of spurred me on and made me feel like I could keep going and I feel like it's my responsibility now. I'm making this little contribution to the neighborhood. My hope is that, you know, you, you walk by and you see this message and it gives you just a little bit of hope and a little bit of support to go on and do something better. We have had some very heavy days, so that is just lovely to see. Thanks so much. That is The National for August 22nd. Good night.